Minister with responsibility for Casper, Carly Morton, from my secretary in the Ministry of Tourism, Raquel Brown, CEO, Tourism Authority, Mr. Damien Hobson, Chairman of the Board of SCASPA, and other board members present, Fafida Stewart, CEO, Officer in Charge, and CFO at SCASPA, members of the media, other representatives of immigration, customs, and other supporters, good morning. We have just been through a very detailed tour of the retrofitted RLB airport. airport. We have been through coming through the parking lot, right up through check-in, screening on the tarmac, and transition to coming into RLB and through the facility retrofitted for what we face now as a pandemic in our world today. And I hope that the details have allayed any fears that you might have that RLB is ready to welcome passengers to our shores. And now we'll call on the Minister with Responsibility for SCASPA, Honorable Lindsey Grant, to give some words of comfort and remarks for us. Mr. Grant, Honorable Grant. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will adopt the protocol as designated by the chairperson, save and accept to recognize the chairman of SCASPA, Mr. <coughs> Damien Hobson, the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Tourism, Carly Henry Morton, and the chief executive officer of the Tourism Authority, Raquel Brown. Good morning and welcome to all. You would have just received an exclusive insight into the substantially completed retrofitted works at the arrivals area and the new COVID-19 passenger arriving and departing processes at the RLB International Airport. As you're aware, on Saturday, October the 31st, 2020, the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis officially reopened our borders to commercial flights. The first of which is scheduled to arrive at the RLB and it's scheduled to arrive on Saturday, November the 7th, 2020, with, I am advised, somewhere in the region, as of today, 122 passengers. That means the flight is technically full, because it is a 128-seater. The St. Christopher Air and Seaports Authority, SCASPA, has been working diligently within a very short period to ensure that the airport's infrastructure and facilities are adequate for the safe processing of all passengers. The upgrade to the infrastructure Included, I don't know if you went so far as the resurfacing of the Alpha Taxiway, the longest taxiway used primarily for the larger airlines, and the connection of Taxiway Alpha and Taxiway Bravo, and the parking apron. As far as the enhancement of the facilities is concerned, a welcome center and isolation center were constructed the arrivals VIP lounge converted into a medical screening unit. The customs baggage area upgraded and the parking lot redesigned, as you had just witnessed, all in an attempt to reduce the spread and the risk of the COVID-19. At arrivals, the process, as you just saw, has been augmented as the risks are higher especially 
since we have seen an uptick of the COVID-19 cases in our source markets, such as the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Europe, and in some countries within the bubble. But I know some of you may say the bubble now does not exist. <laughs> we simply cannot be too careful. The extensive input from the medical professionals and from the NIAC into the retrofit works and the protocols have given us tremendous comfort that as a team, we can certainly minimize the spread of the COVID-19. Upon disembarking the aircraft, the airline handler would direct the arriving passengers to the welcome center where they would be greeted by Casper's customer service ambassadors. The Welcome Center, as indicated previously, is one of the new facilities recently added as a holding area with modern conveniences for the comfort of passengers just before entering the arrival hall. It has been, it has a waiting area geared at allowing the passengers an opportunity to regularize their body temperature ahead of the thermal screening. This area also has the relevant material displayed on the screens and a SCASPA representative to provide information and to manage the passenger flow. The formal medical screening process begins on entrance to the arrival hall, where passengers will be queued as they await their turn to enter the medical screening unit. The medical screening unit, as you would recognize, is outfitted with four stations, occupied by health surveillance officers, who among other screening procedures, perform temperature checks and validate the health data, such as the PCR test previously submitted. The unit also houses a testing station. Passengers who are deemed to be high risk would be escorted to the isolation center where further medical evaluation would be undertaken by the medical team. And then the, the passenger will be later transported to either the COVID-19 ward at the Joseph N. France General Hospital or to a quarantine accommodation site. If all health requirements are met, and there are no symptoms of the COVID-19, the passenger is then allowed to exit the medical screening unit to immigration and then to customs. Passengers are expected to manage their luggage as red cap service will not be available at the arrivals in the customs area as is normally customary in the interest of minimizing all contact. After exiting the customs baggage hall, passengers would visit the dispatch booths where the dispatch officers will, one, take their relevant information to facilitate contact tracing, two, guide the passengers via a receipt to their respective COVID area a SCASPA team member would inspect your passport and any other required travel documents to be allowed entry into the check-in area. The airport staff operating at the check-in counters, security screening areas, departing counters, bars and concession areas are all protected by plexiglass sneeze guards. Additionally, throughout the airport, the following safety measures are in place, such as, but not limited to, the enforcement of the wearing of the mask and hand sanitization, markers on the floors and on seating to enforce the three-foot physical distancing of passengers, and directional signs to guide the passengers' movements. Now that the borders are open, and while SCASPA and NIOC, the health professionals and by extension the cabinet, have put measures in place to protect you, 
We cannot successfully tackle the spread of the COVID-19 without each and every one of us taking personal responsibility for our own safety. So I encourage you to wear your masks properly, sanitize, and physical distance. It would be remiss of me not to thank a number of organizations, persons, and institutions who contributed to where we are today. And this list is not exhaustive. The SCASPA team, of course, for rising to the occasion to make this possible in very short order. The construction team of BOA Architects, Ballet Construction, Interior Designer Lorraine Woods for the beautiful, safe, and expeditious retrofit of these facilities. I'm certain, I, would, I know most people don't um, like the COVID-19, but as I came here this morning again, I say, thank God for COVID, <laughs> because the airport looks lovely. <laughs> SKTA for the destination branding of the walls. NEOC, their committee ably led by Abdia Samuels and the CMO, Dr. Laws, and her team for their guidance in making the facilities very, very safe. The other government agencies at the airports, such as Customs and Immigration, for their very timely input. A hearty thank you. And I wish also to thank the citizens of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, who have demonstrated over the last several months patience. As a government, we have done our best to prepare for the reopening of our borders safely. We are happy to welcome our visitors to our twin island paradise and our citizens and our residents back home. It is now up to all of us to comply to ensure a successful outcome. Thank you very much. I suspect uh, we will await the media for any mm -hmm. questions that mm -hmm. they may have. Um, Authentication of the PCR test because I assume there are a number of laboratories in the United States, Canada, and UK, wherever they are coming from. So, how is their um, authentication of those tests? The medical team will determine the authentication of that PCR test. Remembering, of course, all the particulars would have had to be downloaded prior to the arrival of the passengers here and the medical team will then determine whether or not that PCR test is of the standard that they would require. Good morning, Devon Cardi with us, Wind FM. Um, Mr. Grant, at the last COVID-19 emergency for, you mentioned that the Retrofit project is estimated to cost two million dollars, and uh, my understanding is it's at a cost of two point six million dollars. That is phase one. Um, what is the cost of phase two? Well, what I did say on the last occasion was that the retrofit works was costing in the region of two point six to two point seven million US dollars. That would have been for phase one and phase two. However, because of the changes that we would have made to ensure that persons are much safer than they would have been prior to the configuration before, it meant that the $2.7 million was used in total for phase one of the project. Therefore, we will have to acquire more funds to complete phase two. Okay. okay, and one last question. Um, how many, um, if any, how many uh, private flights or charter flights have landed here 
in the Federation of Sacred Symbols since the world is really not the first time. And I think Joy or Frida will be able to answer that. I am advised that since the borders have been open, 49 flights have arrived to the RLB International Airport. And where are these flights from? Well, these flights are chartered flights, so they necessarily come from Anguilla, from BVI, Antigua, and Barbuda. Okay. One last question, sorry. I'm also, I saw a video um, some time ago where they were spraying some luggage over in Nevis. Some flights landed over the weekend. Um, would you be able to say what was the substance used to spray those luggage? Um, well, it was used over at the Grand Sam Airport. I, I am not certain. Um, what I can tell you is that um, we are in the process of getting our own to feed us. Um, to ensure the, the, the safety of the persons um, at the customs area. We must appreciate the very um, fluid situation and um, money is scarce at the moment. But although money is scarce, we have to make sure that we put all the necessary measures in place to protect our, our, our people and of course the visitors and, and citizens arriving alive. I would let um, Ms. Stewart add, add something to that. Just to add to what the Minister has said, um, the guidelines that were provided by ICAO and ISATA does not require the public contact. So we're also looking at that recommendation as well to include the best in court. President, um, I noticed on the tour that um, there's, there's still a few bits of um, work being done. Um, last, the last time that um, it was mentioned that we were going to be ready for October 31st, but I see that um, that really is not the case. There's, there's even training going on at the moment. Um, so the question is really, how, are we going to be ready for the weekend flight? Well, let me, let me put it this way. When we stated on the last occasion that we would be ready for October 31st, our readiness was in terms of what we knew, was, which was that there would have been no commercial flights arriving before November 7th. November 7th. Our readiness was in terms of being able to allow the charters, etc. in, which we were allowed, or, um, allowed to. Um, I am advised that come November 7th, we would be ready. Um, I think 95% of the reports of the works are complete. We would have told this morning. Yes, we have one or two um, bits of uh, works to, to complete, but I'm advised that they will be complete. In any event, on November 7th, we will be ready for American Airlines flight, which houses 122 persons. So we have no difficulty with that. What we what you must understand, it's a work in progress. Um, we expect we're gonna have our teething problems on Saturday. It's a new um, and uncharted waters we are in. As you recognize the units of testing 122 persons passing through, obviously the, the, the speed at which we would normally come to the airport is not going to be the same. So, you know, November 7th for us is a moment, a signal moment. And obviously, we will learn from whatever challenges we have um, on the seventh. Good day, uh, Lashan Nixon, uh, Sanky Series Observer. Um, during the walkthrough, uh, we didn't discuss uh, the custom screening process for a potential um, high, high yield specimen. Uh, can that be detailed? Well, as I had indicated in the previous speech, um, they won't even reach here. The high risk person will be walked through the retrofitted VIP area, back out into the isolation um, office, if you want to call it that, at the back. They will then be moved, depending on what the health authorities say, either to the Jena, France General Hospital, or to an isolation center um, to be taken care of, away from the general public. 
calendar is there in the broadcasting operation? Two questions. How long do you anticipate it will take each passenger to get through the procedures for arrivals and departures? And how do you see the withdrawal from the CARICOM model affecting arrivals, arrivals and the tourism products? Well, in the first instance, I don't even think that the health officials know how long they're, they're going to take at the screen. So that's a challenge for us. Um, maybe at the next uh, briefing, we will be able to tell you, look, it's taking now 10 minutes per person. But as, as we stand here, we are, like you, unable to really uh, give you a, an answer um, that may or may not be correct. So I prefer to leave that until after Saturday when we, um, we test the system, so to speak. I think the second question was, um, what's the impact on St. Kitts and Nevis since the, we're not in the CARICOM bubble uh, any longer? Well, you know, I can say it like this. I had a friend who, today is what, today is Wednesday? The fourth. I had a friend who on Monday in a team who underwent his um, PCR test, was negative, and he was scheduled to arrive today. He can no longer arrive, obviously, unless he takes the 14 day quarantine, which he's not prepared to. So the short answer is, yes, we're going to be affected by it, because it's going to be very difficult for persons who really want to come and spend a few days to do that in a quarantine period. But we, you know, we understand the, these are challenging times, and people will have to adjust and readjust to the changing times. And this is just one of those uh, critical times that we have to change to. We expect it to be in the bubble and move freely within the, the eight countries that were designated. But as you know, there have been spikes in other, in other countries, and we are not prepared then to have those persons who are uh, more at risk come into contact with our very low, low risk um, country. So that's a decision the cabinet had to take. Um, very hard decision, but the decision that we have to take in the interest of the people of Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Good morning, Bobby Garrick Media. Um, there's no red cap would be operating here. My question, you have over 100 persons coming in. Some persons come with G4 suitcase. Uh, what are your plans in assisting them to depart from this area? Um, second question, you have um, your first flight coming in, it's over 100, that is good. Um, going forward, you have more flights coming in and you only have about 50 persons. Does it have any bearing on the government to pay for those empty seats? first question was with regard to the um, lack of recaps mm. at the airport. We are going to be provided with uh, luggage carts to help those passengers who require their luggage to, to be moved. And the other thing is I, I suspect that they will also be, be um, helped in some measure by the provider of the transport. Services. Of course, um, hoping as much as possible um, to have as little contact with the individuals and luggage. And I guess, again, come, come November 7th, we will um, be tested and we will then determine where we go from there, whether in terms of we have enough um, on the cards or not. Um, but it's, uh, it's uh, uh, a work in progress. The other, the other point I think you raised was, was with respect to what will happen with the MTC, yes. like. yeah. well, we have been in, um, in what we call MRGs, minimum revenue guarantees with the airlines for several years. We have been um, doing very well in terms of the number of persons we have brought to St. Kitts and Nevis. And for a number of years, we have not paid out on our guarantees uh, to American Airlines. Um, this year may possibly be a different scenario. We don't know. Um, what I can say is the first flight is, is, is full, really. 
And if it continues like that, then hopefully we will pay out on our, on our guarantees. And so we are hopeful that over the next couple of weeks, as you recognize, we, we have one flight per week at the moment. I think we are scheduled to go to three flights um, a week. We are not going to go towards the daily flight as we are normally accustomed to because we don't expect that we're going to have the type of demand that we had in 2019. We're going to have that in 2020. Um, just, to, just to follow up, so if there's a case where um, there are more flights coming in and you don't have the capacity, would the government, uh, what will the government do um, in these instances now that we are approaching our December, which is our carnival season, and I'm sure there's some sort of activity will be happening here, will attract persons to our show? Well, we are always on a weekly dialogue with our airport partners. And we are on a weekly dialogue with them because we monitor the flights very carefully to determine whether or not we're going to add flights or whether or not we're going to take away flights. All in an effort to save the government money and, and to make sure that the flights do not come here empty. So we will continue that dialogue from the Ministry of Tourism and the Sacred Stones Authority. We will continue that dialogue with the airlines to ensure that we maximize on our capacity of the, of, of, of the flights coming into St. Good morning, Minister Jim. A couple of questions. Um, sticking on the, the topic that you're talking about and flights, has the Ministry been in discussion with the carriers with regards to increased capacity? To, to the island in the sense that looking at what's happening outside at the moment, um, there seemingly is, I, I don't want to say a, a limit or a restriction, but there seemingly is a, a slight restriction in terms of capacity. Let's say we, we get the demand in December, two or three flights, maybe per day. How is that going to be working in terms of this new measure that has been put in place and all the restrictions and, and, and so forth. I will let Raquel Brown from the SPT answer that question as well as she will be dance to it.
the airline doesn't have an opportunity to use that gift. And so that's our ideal uh, revenue issue for them. Okay, um, a couple of other questions. One, is there any consideration, and this is probably more for the minister, is there any consideration to upgrading what is currently out there should the demand, the demand for flights come to think it's needed? Um, especially with the fact that there are only, well, from what you see, there are only two isolation rooms outside. Um, what happens if a passenger, as we have seen this happening, what happens if a passenger travels and for some reason, miraculously, he doesn't, he or she doesn't come with their COVID-19 test, even though they would have forwarded it to St. Kitts and Eight already. We've been seeing it happening. Uh, we don't know how that's been happening, but uh, especially those in transit and they, they were stopped. So what happens in an event that that happens? And let me, let me, let me answer your, your last question first. My advice and understanding is, is that um, we are seeking to put a measure in place, just like you grant um, board the, an aircraft, let us say, unless you have the requisite travel requirements for arriving to some kids. Uh, we are intending to do the same as it regards to the, the, the PCR test, meaning we should not be allowed to enter onto a flight unless you have a particular test to produce on the other end. So that nobody should be arriving into some kids without a PCR test and for all practical purposes. However, let us suppose that for some reason an individual arrives into some kids without a PCR test. I'm, an, I'm not a medical expert, but I would, I would expect that that person would have to go directly to the isolation center, directly away from any of them. If that answers the question. The other one was what we'll do in case that more flights arrive, etc. We have also considered expanding the area towards the, um, the hangar. Uh, so if that becomes necessary, we will expand um, towards there. Sure. As it relates to uh, persons coming, we understand uh, coming on flights. Uh, last night you were issued from the chairman of the COVID-19 task force with samples of what the pre-authorization form looks like. And so um, both here with our airline agents and also through with our, our airline partners, specifically for American Airlines, we're sending that sample. So whether they're checking in um, from another gateway or they're checking in in Miami, the counter will know this is what is required for them to go on the flight. Okay, and my last two questions. One, um, what happens if Mr. Abel enters St. Kitts and Nevis, he's stopped, he's moved to isolation, and he's found to be testing positive, she tested positive for COVID-19. And he's saying, look, I prefer to um, travel back to the United States for treatment there, because maybe I, I am not so happy with what I'm needed to get in here in St. Kitts and Nevis. Is the government or the ministry willing to afford that person if they say, hey, look, I'm going to take a medevac flight to Miami? And Absolutely not. Okay. So they have to spend 40 days and get their treatment in St. Kitts. Absolutely. They can't take the risk of sending it back on a plane to persons who would be negative. Well, if, even if they, they decide to take a medevac flight to Miami or wherever it is. Even if they decide to take a medevac flight back to, to wherever they came from? Well, that, that will be have to be worked out with the authorities on the other end. For us, it's okay if he's going by himself on a medevac, that's fine. But obviously, we'll have to be in contact with the, 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 the country in which he's going to make sure that they will receive him in that condition. Okay, and my final question has to do with the moving away from the reopening of the border, the cruise industry. Um, how is preparation coming for, for when that reopens? I understand because we now hear that CDC and on the cruise line they say not up until you're not going to be cruising before the 31st of December. How is preparation coming for when that second reopens? I'll answer it in this way: we've been exerting all our time, energy, 
and resources on the opening of our borders and specifically the RMB International Airport. We have, however, been in dialogue with the cruise lines almost on a daily basis, trying to um, determine what is going to be the, the, <clears throat> the date when they are looking to, to begin to sail. We, we have been um, behind the scenes ensuring that we start to step up the game in terms of putting procedures and practices and protocols in place for when cruising um, arrives and again into St. Kitts and Nevis. But if I were to fathom a guess, I don't believe we will begin that until sometime in 2021. So we will begin our outfitting of the uh, Port Zante to make sure that we are up to the level and the standard as required by the industry when the cruises begin. Any some persons to change their minds from coming to the Federation. So the question really would be to the Tourism Authority, have other ways of attracting long-term visitors been investigated? For example, there are some islands that are offering a work from the beach type of package because, you know, the time in quarantine would kind of change persons' minds from shorter stays, but what about longer stays? Uh, so, with the change of the regulations, it must be with the Car Car Caribbean bubble. We are not the only island now. So Barbados is in there, Grenada is in there, and St. Vincent has implemented a, a mandatory five-day quarantine. Uh, as it speaks to um, our tourism market, what we're doing first is just to get the first decision was to get the destination reopened. Those bookings that were there for the short term to address those and to see how persons can still come and have their vacations if they would like to have their vacations. Yes, we're looking at something involved in the CPI program um, as it relates to persons, how we could um, blend them together to get an opportunity. Every Caribbean island is doing it, so it is going to be based on the one that has the most competitive offer. Uh, so we also have to look at if there are other exclusive opportunities through marketing where persons may be coming not for a long term for a year, but they're willing to come to stay for six weeks because it's that vacation time that they normally spend when it's the winter time or it is the spring time. So yes, we're looking at all alternatives. Uh, everyone is looking at the market for persons to come and work. And for us, yes, that's an opportunity, but we also have to diversify the opportunity. So we're looking at every opportunity possible. Hello, We have spoke briefly about Port Zante. In terms of Crystal Harbor, for instance, are yachts being allowed to enter? And if so, what protocols are in place or would it be in place? Last night, you would have heard the requirements as it speaks to sea vessels, sea vessels specifically private vessels, not commercial for crews. Uh, there are requirements there as it speaks to how they will be entering the Federation. Unfortunately for us, we're entering the season very late. We are in November, and most of the persons who have who would, would be thinking about we um, entering the Caribbean, for example, from Europe or even coming from the United States, they would have already decided the location they would have wanted to come to from as early as August. It doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't opportunities, but the opportunities right now for November, unlike the regular stay over, as it speaks to hotel accommodation, that time has already kind of passed for yachting. So the opportunity is there for next year. However, um, what we'll be getting is what persons may be making a last minute decision. I recognize that there are no other questions. So I want to thank the 
media houses for coming out this morning on our media tour. And I want to thank Rafida Stewart and Raphael Brown for supplementing the answers to some of the questions you may have posed. So we thank you very much for coming out and we want you to have a, a wonderful day. Thank you.